So the next question we got to consider is, well, if the small reactors are so good, why might they fall short? The first answer has to do with economics. Um, so why don't we move to that? And uh, the short answer here is because they're small, uh, they don't really produce economies associated with the production of a large amount of electricity because they produce less electricity. So the only way you can get economies of scale with small reactors is make the reactors capital construction costs much, much lower. And you can do that, they claim, by making a lot of them in, in factories off site. However, um, it's not all that clear that uh, that's going to work. And, and part of the reason is for the reason I pointed out with some of the, the latest large modular reactors. They're modular too. Their costs were supposed to come down. Their costs did not come down. For some reason, people think, oh, well, if we make them small and modular, that modularity will work when they're small, when they didn't work when the modularity was in reference to large ones. So, for example, uh, there's a new scale reactor that uh, is the uh, sort of the, the uh, I guess what would you call it, uh, the, the, uh, the main event uh, for nuclear power's uh, uh, resurgence or resurrection. And, you know, it's just in the matter of a year or two or three gone from estimated $3 billion for 720 megawatts electrical to over $6 billion. Well, that's not the direction you want to go. The argument is, oh, well, once we make a lot of these, you know, they'll come down. Well, what if they don't make a lot? In other words, are there going to be a lot of orders for these things? Jury's out. History suggests uh, this is a raffle ticket on a raffle ticket. Uh, the second problem with economics with these small reactors is that many of them, and almost all, rely on new kinds of fuels that require new fuel making plants, uh, and either enrichment of uranium to nearly 20%, which is called high assay, low enriched uranium or hollow fuel. Uh, most low enriched uranium is around three to five percent, not 19.75 uh, percent, or they require plutonium based fuels, uh, which requires reprocessing. The latter, well, neither of these activities are economically uh, that attractive right now. Uh, there's a super abundance of low enriched uranium enrichment capacity and reprocessing. Uh, you, you lose money doing it uh, because fresh uranium fuel is so much cheaper. So in order for these new small reactors to move forward with their new fuels, they're gonna need government development and support. That's code for lots of appropriations and subsidies. So, you know, if you wanna count the costs, that's a cost that, you know, maybe they think they can take off the books, but someone's gotta pay for it. Um, now, I just mentioned uh, that some of the fuels are, you know, advanced. Uh, part of the reason, uh, not entirely, but part of the reason uh, the fuels need to be advanced is that the advanced reactors in question, a good portion of them, are going to be fast reactors. Uh, they employ neutrons that are uh, moving at higher energy levels, if you will. Uh, than what's normally used in the kinds of thermal reactors that we use today. These fast reactors um, are historically not cheap. They're more expensive than regular thermal reactors. Um, then uh, they say, oh, but uh, they're carbon free. Well, yeah. And then the argument is, is it carbon being carbon free is worth a great deal. 
it'll cover up all of these other costs. That isn't really true, uh, as we'll see momentarily. There are cheaper, quicker ways to reduce greenhouse gases than building reactors of any sort, much less ones that might turn out to be more expensive per kilowatt hour than the ones we currently have. Um, also, I think um, some of the proposed design, designs are pretty large. I mean, 500 megawatts electrical, it, you start wondering whether you're building a small reactor anymore. Um, so I don't know how that works. Uh, I don't know if we're even getting the advantages of being small, if small is that large. But why don't we uh, go forward and take a look at some of these points in greater depth. All right, now it's sad but true, but we've been here before. The first uh, set of reactors in the 60s were small. They included fast reactors. They included thermal reactors. They included uh, high temperature gas cooled reactors. It didn't seem to matter. Uh, all of these things had to be turned off. None of them were economically viable. And so what you're saying is, well, the concept isn't new, but we're going we're gonna to take the concept and put uh, new technology in it. I suppose it would be like saying, well, we have a Model T, but imagine a Model T that had disc brakes and that had a limited slip differential and that uh, we had direct injection uh, engine instead of, uh, you know, a carburetor. Well, okay, but, um, you know, the question is whether those modest changes are going to make that much of a difference. We will see, but history doesn't suggest that you're necessarily on a roll here. Go to the next slide. In fact, the uh, small reactors that are being highly touted, not just here, but in China, want to pick up the lessons of the generation three modular approach. And you would think, well, they would do better at it. Um, here's an example where the speedy Chinese uh, kind of got slowed in their tracks. Uh, they were supposed to get done with a something called the ACP 100 modular reactors, which were about 100 to 150 megawatts electrical. Uh, they began supposedly in 2011. And um, we're going to come online in 2013, but they haven't yet. Um, now, you know, I suppose we, you know, one can do research as to why not, but I think the general point here is just saying modular isn't a guarantee that anything gets built, much less gets built speedily or inexpensively. Let's go to the next chart. Now, if that wasn't enough, a good number of the concepts for the small reactors employ fast reactor technologies. Um, our favorite uh, uh, rich person, Bill Gates, has his traveling wave reactor project. Um, there are a number of fast molten chloride uh, and uh, lead and salt reactors. Some of these are shown here, some are Japanese. The PRISM reactor is a um, reactor that was a fast breeder reactor that's been turned into a test reactor, it's, but it's still quite large. It's, I believe it's 100 megawatts or more. Um, so when you go fast, there is a history there. Let's go to the next slide. Um, this is a pretty good indication of what you're bucking if you go fast. Uh, here are the historical performances of uh, sodium cooled uh, versus, uh, that would be your green and blue, versus uh, heavy water and a light water uh, reactor and gas cooled. Um, you can tell that you're in the blue and green, you're taking on historically some bad numbers and you're saying, oh, we'll overcome that as well. Why are they more expensive? Well, fast reactors are more complex and they require, you know, very different techniques and involve materials that 
uh, sometimes are actually explosive. You know, liquid sodium, for example, when it's exposed to air or water, explodes. So it's, it's not just another way to do nuclear reactions. You gotta overcome that. What's the next slide? Well, again, as I mentioned, um, perhaps to, to, to soften the blow, uh, some of these plants are being paid for outright or heavily subsidized by the US government. The versatile test reactor is being claimed to be a major R&D uh, facility. Uh, it's hard to believe that developing fast reactor fuels is major R&D only because I always thought the difference between R&D and commercialization was, in commercialization, you know from the past you can do it. Well, we know that fast uh, fuels can be made. Uh, we've done it before, both privately and in government. But, well, these are gonna be different, and so they call it R&D. This is basically a commercialization giveaway in my book. But, you know, maybe I just have bad attitude. In any case, the government's picking up the tab on this. And you can see it's not small, it's three to six billion dollars. Then for the fuels associated with uh, the high assay, low enriched uranium uh, fuels for the uh, um, small modular reactors, well, oh, we're gonna provide uh, the additional enrichment. You know, some of these alternatives are really expensive, 10 extra billion dollars. So, you know, when you're trying to figure out the economics of these things, you really need to kind of dial in all of these costs, whether you know they're shown on the, the price ticker or not, because somebody has to pay for this, and these costs are not associated with other kinds of reactors. Next slide. Now, the, the catch-all argument is yes, but they're so wonderful because they're carbon-free, and carbon-free is worth a lot of money, and therefore we can ignore all this. And if we really want to meet our carbon objectives, we're going to have to have nuclear because it's carbon free and we're going to need as much of it as we can get, even if we can't get a lot of it. Whew. Well, maybe, but um, let's take a look at how industry looks at this. There is a model that is used by the McKenzie company called the, uh, uh, let's see if I get this right, the uh, greenhouse gas cost abatement curve. It's a very fancy set of words and, and phrase, but what it means is it's a model, and it's now, this is the public model I'm showing you here on the screen. There's the proprietary model, uh, which you can't get access to, but essentially it's a model that industry and uh, environmental groups use, which I find rather intriguing that they both use it. Uh, and it, for both groups, it gives the same answer, and the, that is that you don't build a nuclear power, a new, a uh, nuclear power plant uh, until you've gone through, I don't know, about 11 other things. Why? If you want to reduce greenhouse gases and carbon in particular, there are cheaper, quicker ways to do it than build a new power reactor. Um, to try to give you some idea, the power reactor here is at about 130 or 140 uh, dollars per metric ton. It's between the red and the orange blocks. Uh, if you can, well, if you can see, uh, there you go. That's it. Well, all of these other steps come before it. If you just turn off the lights and you pay people to do that, you can actually make money uh, saving carbon. You can actually make money saving carbon. So that's not just cheaper; it's profitable. Whereas these other things, you're going to have to put money out, and you you will lose money reducing carbon. Uh, if you uh, make the uh, power plants that currently uh, run, uh, if, you, if you make it so that they're refueled more frequently, uh, that makes more economic sense. Um, I just said more frequently, less frequently. Uh, you can get more power out of the existing reactors. This is a trend that's been going on for some time. Doesn't involve constructing new power plants though. Uh, converting coal plants, uh, by using natural gas or replacing natural gas with renewables and batteries. All of these things come before building a nuclear power plant. So just saying that, well, it doesn't matter because it, it, it saves uh, against the, the, the budget of producing 
carbon or greenhouse gases is not a complete thought. It has to compete on this curve or some model like that. And right now it doesn't. Uh, next. Now, when we take a look at the question of um, gas and renewable alternatives, there are two concerns. The first concern is, are they getting more or less expensive compared to nuclear? And we have a um, source with Lazar, which is the, one of the only, and thankfully one of the most reputable private uh, sources of projection and modeling and data on these costs. And as you can see to the right, uh, the red line is nuclear, and, and, and in 2018, uh, it was you know approximately 12 cents uh, per kilowatt, uh, and it is projected to continue to climb, as you can see through 2023, to perhaps as much as 16 cents. Meanwhile, combined gas, which is that orange line, is you know, in around six cents or five, five and a half to six cents and is projected to go down to, uh, well, let's see, that's less than four cents. Meanwhile, wind is projected to go quite low along with solar uh, to like two cents. Now, those are not favorable trends, but then the argument will be, oh, but, you can't store all of that. Now, in the case of gas, you don't need to store it. Um, so gas is a problem. Uh, and then you say, oh, but it's not entirely clean. Well, it's pretty clean. It's, it's about half as dirty as uh, coal, actually 60% cleaner in some cases. Uh, there are projections with regard to battery storage, various kinds of batteries here, flow batteries, compressed air, uh, lithium ion batteries. Uh, that say that with scale, uh, they will come down such that you will not only get battery storage that's cheap uh, with regard to, you know, what it costs, uh, but that the duration of how long you can hold energy in a battery will increase with time as well. So small nuclear has to battle those trends. It may do so, uh, but it certainly is going to have an uphill battle. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and there is a possibility technically to capture uh, all of the um, carbon and, and uh, nitrogen associated with uh, gas-fired plants. This is an alum cycle generator, which is being paid for not by the Department of Energy, but by two private firms. Um, one of them is Duke Power and the other is, um, oh gosh, uh, Toshiba. And uh, this is connected to the grid. It's 15 megawatts electrical and they wanna scale it up. We will see, it produces virtually no emissions at four to five cents per kilowatt hour, they claim. Watch this box, it may or may not pan out, but you can see that you know the arguments about small nuclear and cleanliness are you know have to be taken uh, in the context of the competition. Economically, it is not clear that advanced nuclear will make it. Uh, the jury is at least out.